Good morning. Welcome to Discovery's Digital Gathering. We are glad you're here. We are excited for what God has in store this morning. We want to invite you to download our app, which will help you stay current with our community and get further connected by filling out our new visitor card. Let's prepare our hearts for worship and for the adventure of discovering the good news of Jesus together. Good morning, friends. My name is Steve. I'm the lead pastor here at Discovery and also your host for today's digital gathering. As we prepare to worship together, let's begin with this reading from Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. The word of the Lord. Shake out the sound of 
Jesus' name. Last mean hope I do wake at the sound of Jesus' name. With the speed of the Lord, there's sweet, there's sweet up. With the speed of the Lord. Well, thanks for worshiping with us. Thank you, James, for leading us in worship. If you're uh, new to Discovery or just checking us out today online, I want to say a special welcome to you. I want to invite you uh, to take one simple step today, which is to fill out our connection card. You can do this by downloading the Discovery Christian Church app from any app store. And then the very first thing that you'll see on the screen is uh, a link to that card. Click on that, a couple pieces of information, and you will be well on your way to getting plugged into all the information that we share about what's going on here at Discovery. Now, speaking of things going on here at Discovery, coming up in April, some, some big moments for us. On April 10th, we're going to be celebrating uh, parent-child dedications. This is a, a beautiful moment for us as a church family to come around uh, our parents and families and kids and say that we're with you in this great task of parenting. So if you are a parent or a guardian of a child that you would like to dedicate uh, on that day, again, April 10th will be uh, the Sunday that we do that at the in-person gathering in the theater. You can let me know, steve at discoverydavis.org. We can start that conversation and get you ready for that. The very next week is Easter. I want to already start priming you for that. We're in the season of Lent. We're preparing our hearts for Easter. I want you to be thinking through who you might want to invite to that. Our Easter gathering is a really, really exciting moment for a whole bunch of reasons. Obviously, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, but in that, we're also uh, getting to hear from people and, and storytelling through baptisms. And so if you are, are interested, if you have questions about baptism, if you feel like you're ready to take this step of publicly proclaiming your faith in Jesus to our community, Easter Sunday is going to be the, uh, the time to do that. Great opportunity to share your story. And again, to have the community come around you and celebrate with you this, this big moment and decision in your life. Uh, once again, email me, steve at discoverydavis.org, if you would like to talk more about baptisms. Now, at this point in our gathering, we pause, we take a moment to reflect on God's great generosity towards us. God has blessed us in so many different ways with time, with talents, but also with treasure, right? Financial resources that he has entrusted to us that we then get to give back to him uh, to be used to help people discover the good news of Jesus, both here in Davis, but also around the world. You can give uh, to Discovery uh, very safely and easily online, again, through our Discovery Christian Church app or go to discoverydavis.org and uh, uh, you can click on the give button there. Um, you can also send checks to our office, 508 2nd Street here in Davis. Um, and then if you're at an in-person gathering, you can also uh, drop your tithe off there as well. Here at Discovery, we aim to give worshipfully, missionally, and sacrificially. Again, as we together discover the good news of Jesus and help others do so as well. Would you pray with me for this morning's offering? Heavenly Father, we are, are so grateful for your blessings in our lives, the, the ways that you have equipped us to participate in your kingdom, to be a part of your mission here in this world. God, we pray that you would take whatever we're able to give today that you would multiply it many times over, that you would use it far beyond our wildest imaginations to share the good news of Jesus with many people here in Davis, on campus, around the greater uh, Sacramento, Yolo County area, even to the ends of the earth, God, you would use these resources to build your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, meet me this morning in Acts Chapter 18. Today we uh, pick up a conversation that we have been in for a while. We've taken a little bit of a break from our journey through the book of Acts, but we return today 
to the book of Acts, this conversation that we are calling ecclesia. Recall that ecclesia is the Greek word that is most often translated church in our English Bibles. Now, the big idea of this conversation has been all about immersing ourselves in the stories of the early church. These stories that we are are desiring to shape our holy imaginations. We want to be asking the question, what could the church look like right now in our time and in our place? And what's beautiful about the book of Acts is that it doesn't give us a formula. It's not a four-step plan. Here's how you have a great church. It gives us these stories, these stories that help us to see, right? That, that fire our imaginations for the beauty of the adventure of following Jesus together. Now we pick the story back up in a very interesting place. We're in chapter 18 today, but this is winding down one of the larger sections in Acts. Chapter 19 is actually where the section ends and the final section begins. Acts 19, 20, and 21, we, we read this. The word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. That little phrase is used often five or six times through the book of Acts. It's one of the major markers of we're moving into something new now. So the word of the Lord spread widely. And then after all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. And then he says, after I have been there, I must visit Rome also. So starting there at Acts 19, verse 20 and 21, all the action in the book of Acts is about getting Paul to Rome. And he kind of puts out his mission statement in this way. This is now Acts 20, verse 24. Paul says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race. For him, that race is getting to Rome to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. This is our theme for this final pass through the book of Acts. How do we take up this task? What does it look like for us to testify to the good news of God's grace in Davis in 2022? <clears throat> now, this all leads us to Acts chapter 18, our, our text for this morning. I'm going to read uh, for us now verses 24 through 28, and I'm going to be reading from the Common English Bible translation instead of our normal NIV. Meanwhile, a certain Jew named Apollos arrived in Ephesus. He was a native of Alexandria and was well-educated and effective in his use of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke as one stirred up by the Spirit. He taught accurately the things about Jesus, even though he was aware only of the baptism of John proclaimed and practiced. He began speaking with confidence in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila, now remember these names, this is a couple that we're going to get to know better here in just a few moments. When Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos, they received him into their circle of friends and explained to him God's way more accurately. When Apollos wanted to travel to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples so they would open their homes to him. Once he arrived, he was of great help to those who had come to believe through grace. He would vigorously defeat Jewish arguments in public debate using the scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Christ. Let's pray as we get ready to dig into this a little bit further. Heavenly Father, we... Uh, we're grateful to be back in this conversation in Acts this morning. God, would you continue to use these stories, as we've said so many times, to shape our imagination, to fire our imaginations for what the church could look like here in Davis in 2022. God, would you speak to us? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us this morning through the example of Priscilla and Aquila? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to begin, I want us to think through, I want you to get in your mind a, a, a person, a coach, a mentor, a teacher, a leader of some sort, somebody who made a tremendous impact on your life. What did they do? What did they do that was so important and meaningful? Our kids just started baseball and softball season, and as a parent, you're always eager to find out, okay, who, who's going to be the coach of the team this year? What kind of person are they? What's their attitude? How are they going to treat the kids? How do they speak to the kids? All that kind of stuff, right? Who is going to be influencing my child 
for the next couple of months. If you've ever played sports, you know coaches can have a tremendous impact on your experience as a player. Obviously, bad coaches leave this negative impression, sometimes even worse. But then there's good coaches and great coaches, right? Good coaches, you have fun, you get better, but they're, they're not maybe the type of person that you remember five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, right? But great coaches, great coaches, <clears throat> you remember them. They, they leave a legacy, an imprint on your life. Now, here's the thing. It might not have even been a very good team, right? You might have had a lot of, you might have lost a lot of games, but your coach left this impact in your life. And it wasn't just about the skills or improving your game. Good coaches make you a better player. Great coaches make you a better person. We see here in Acts chapter 18, we see an example of great coaching. This is one of the best pictures of what we call here at Discovery hero making that we get anywhere in the Bible. Now, I'm going to unpack this word hero making a little bit more as as we move through our conversation today. But if you have some church background, you've probably heard of like discipleship, disciple making. We use that interchangeably with this term hero making. Now, as we, as we, Near the end of this section, again, remember, next chapter, chapter 19, marks the end of one of the big sections in Acts. Paul and a bunch of other people have been traveling around starting new churches. This is Paul in the, the, the middle of his mission of taking the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. But here at the beginning of chapter 18, Paul has been in this city called Corinth. He's been there for a while, and this is where he meets this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, if you look at, at the first couple of verses of Acts 18, 2 and 3, you'll see their introduction to one another. And we don't get a ton of details here about what they, what they did or, or, or what they talked about, but notice this, they work together. They work together. They're making tents. And you can imagine them sitting together with you know, needle and thread, stitching these tents together for hours. This time that they spent, that was extremely valuable to Paul, right? Paul's investment in Priscilla and Aquila, as they spend that time, he's testifying to them about the good news of God's grace. And this is so important because the means through which this testifying happens is not maybe what we typically think of as discipleship or hero making, right? This isn't Paul giving them a lecture or a sermon or going through a Bible study. It's just the conversations they're having as they stitch these tents together right away. Right away, our holy imaginations should be going nuts thinking about all the possibilities here, right? What are the things that you do regularly? What are the things that you are already doing that could be the means to having hero-making conversations with other people? Maybe it's working out. Maybe it's going to the park. Maybe it's watching sports. Maybe it's snowboarding. Maybe it's just running errands. Whatever it might be, there's all kinds of opportunities even relatively mundane things, all kinds of opportunities to have these incredibly meaningful, formative conversations with people. We need, I, I feel so strongly about this, we need to eradicate the idea that discipleship only happens on a specific day for one hour or whatever it is where we sit down and exchange information and ideas about the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong, that's not a bad thing. If that's part of your rhythm and your practices, that's great, but that's just one small part of it. We need to have a a bigger, wider definition. And one reason for this is simply because that's not how Jesus and Paul do disciple-making, hero-making, right? They find ways to integrate what they're already doing, making tents, fishing, walking from one place to another. They use these opportunities to invest in other people. For Paul, this this time that he spends with Priscilla and Aquila pays off tremendously because when Paul leaves Corinth for the next place, who does he take with him? Okay, look at verse 18. Priscilla and Aquila. Hey guys, let's go on this adventure together. So they take off. Paul actually drops them off in Ephesus. Now Ephesus is, is a place that Paul will spend quite a bit of time in in the next chapter. It's kind of his last deep dive into a place before he begins his journey to Rome. But at this point, Paul moves on, Priscilla and Aquila stay, and we're going to see the hero-making process 
repeat, right? So Paul invests all this time in, in Priscilla and Aquila, and now they're going to have the opportunity to do that for this guy named Apollos. We're going to watch Priscilla and Aquila help Apollos move from follower to guide. From follower to guide. Now you may be thinking, all right, that's interesting terminology. Where did you come up with that? Here at Discovery, we've put some language to the discipleship process. We call it the discipleship wheel, and it works like this. Okay, There's sort of a pre-discipleship wheel category of people who just aren't interested yet. We actually see some of this in chapter 18. Look at verse 6, right? Paul faces this opposition, and he finds these people who just don't want to hear it, right? And so he just kind of moves on to the next thing. We will definitely encounter those sorts of people. But once people begin to show some interest, there are some phases that, that, that people typically move through. The first phase would be what we call wanderers, right? These are people who are just not sure about God, Jesus, the church, all this stuff, but they're looking for fun, they're looking for belonging, they're trying to connect, or they've just had people, Jesus followers, sort of invade their life, right, and invite them to stuff. And so they're, they're in this movement from no community to receiving community. From wanderers, though, people move into the next phase called sojourners where they're asking big questions, right? What is the point of all of this? Who am I? Why am I here? These kind of big existential questions. There's a movement from receiving community to now becoming part of the community. From there, people become explorers, where they're asking now more specific questions. Okay, what about Jesus? They they might be practicing parts uh, of the kingdom, trying out different things. They're looking for answers now to these questions, not just asking the questions, but looking for answers. They move from becoming part of the community to now building the community. And actually, explorers, if I can be honest for a minute, my favorite phase in the discipleship process because they tend to not have all the kind of church uh, uh, baggage at that point. From explorers, people then become followers. They're now identifying with Jesus. Yes, I am following Jesus, but they tend to have more of an inward orientation. They're still developing some things in themselves. The movement is from building community, though, to extending community. And this is where we see Apollos, okay? He is a follower. All these great raw materials, right? He has some training. He's stirred up by the Spirit. He's, he's given it a shot. He just needs a little bit more refining. Finally, we see people move from followers to guides. <clears throat> guides are now sharing their good news with people, right? Testifying to the good news of God's grace. They have an outward orientation. They are investing in others, this movement from extending the community to now reproducing the community. And this is where we see Priscilla and Aquila. Now, quick note, just because someone is a, is a quote, guy, doesn't mean that they've arrived or got it all figured out. Sometimes we even repeat the process a little bit. Um, so it's not like spiritual levels that we're talking about. We're also not trying to label people or put people in a box here. We just want to help people move, right? Take that next step closer to Jesus. Now this whole process, the whole wheel taken together, we call hero making. Now of course, Jesus is the hero of the story, but that's sort of the whole point, right? We're not the hero. Jesus is the hero, but we do have this part to play, right? He invites us to get involved by testifying to the good news, helping each other take that next step closer to Jesus. Now, for some of us who are in that like follower guide area, we can sometimes feel like it can be hard to identify ourselves as a guy. Like, oh yeah, like I, I I'm ready to uh, to be a hero maker to invest in other people. Priscilla and Aquila, I think, give us a great model here. There's three things that they show us, three powerful ways that we can be hero makers for other people. First, Priscilla and Aquila invest time into Apollos. To me, one of the key words in the whole chapter is meanwhile, right? In verse 24, meanwhile, Paul goes off on another round of crazy adventures. Paul always getting all the headlines. But meanwhile, Priscilla and Aquila are the ones who are putting down roots, right? This connects us back to our vision conversation a couple weeks ago. Putting down roots, making Ephesus home, decorating their new house, right? Starting their business in this city. They're getting to know their neighbors and they're serving their church. And in that process, they meet Apollos. 
Now, time is interesting because it's one of the hard parts, I think, about discipleship or hero making because it's not quick, right? It really pushes against our instant gratification mindset. It's what Eugene Peterson, who actually steals this line from Nietzsche, calls a long obedience in the same direction. It takes time and it's messy. And while that is challenging, I also think it's freeing. It kind of takes the pressure off. We have to like, you know, do all this stuff, like, you know, give, give people everything that they need. No, we're just part of their process. Priscilla and Aquila, though, have time. They may not be uh, seminarians, theologians, read a million books. They have, they're just tent makers. They have time to invest in Apollos. We all have time. Now, you don't have time to give to everybody. And so one of the most important questions that we can be asking is, who needs my time? Right now, in the next weeks, months, in, in this uh, coming year, who's my Apollos? Who needs my time? Priscilla and Aquila invest time. They also intentionally guide Apollos. So there's time, yes, but there's also this intentionality piece too. And this is really important because Apollos is ready, right? He's passionate. He, he wants to go for it, but he still has more to learn. And so they share with him. Verse 26, they explain the way of God more accurately. Okay, now this is, this is again, a, a, an important piece. Two things can be true at the same time. We all need Priscilla's and Aquila's, but we can also be a Priscilla and Aquila for someone else. Even if we don't know all the things, right? Even if we don't feel like we're fully equipped, we can always say, let's figure this out together. Hero making is not about being the guru. It's about listening, paying attention, asking good questions, and loving people enough to not make it all about you. Now, having said that, there is this intentionality piece within that. We're, we don't want to just wing it and hope for the best. At Discovery, we practice three simple rhythms of discipleship, real simple process that we call up, in, and out. Okay, up, in, and out. Up is about right relationship with God. In is is right relationship with people at church. Out is about right relationship with our neighbors and our community. All kinds of questions you can have uh, in these hero-making conversations just from these three rhythms. Okay, Think about up. Uh, how are you relating to God? Do you feel connected or disconnected? Are there new things that you are discovering about God? What practices are you doing right now or would you like to try to help you foster that connection and that relationship with God? All kinds of ways that that can go. In, who are you getting to know? Do you have people at church that you can sit down with and say, hey, this is me, this is what's going on in my life. Do you maybe need to reach out to someone and initiate that kind of conversation? Or are you in wrong relationship with someone, right? Is there, is there some way you need to reconcile with, with, with somebody in your life? Out, who are you serving? Who are you giving your time and energy to? How are you growing in generosity? All kinds of conversations that we can have around those three things. You don't need to go to a class. You don't need to get a certificate to be a hero maker. You can just sit down with someone and talk through up, in, and out. Now, last thing is Priscilla and Aquila invite Apollos into their community. You guys see that? I did three eyes this week. All right, invest time, <laughs> be intentional, and then invite people into your circle of friends. The American church has reduced discipleship to this one-to-one -one mentoring thing, which again, is not wrong, it's just small. Discipleship is a communal process. And yeah, there's some conversations that just need to happen in a one-to-one -one setting, but to reduce discipleship to only that context is to miss the glory and the power of the church. Priscilla and Aquila together disciple Apollos and then they invite him into their circle of friends. And so Apollos is shaped by the community, by the community into a good guide who then goes to Achaia and can repeat this process with a new community. So Paul invests in Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila invest in Apollos, invite him into their circle of friends. He then goes somewhere else and does the same thing. Verses 27 and 28. Big question for us here is this. How can you be generous with your community? 
Who can you be inviting into your circle of friends? This is what we are all about here at Discovery. These circles of friends, these little communities, these little ecclesias banding together to help each other take that next step closer to Jesus. Now, as we get ready for communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, as we get ready for the table, you may be sitting there thinking, well, that's great, but wow, I'm not even sure if I believe any of this or if I'm in. I don't know about this Jesus, this church stuff. I definitely don't know about hero making. That sounds crazy. My word to you is great. Great. We hope that discovery is a good place to wander and to sojourn and to explore. And wherever we may be at in that process, wherever we may be at in that process, underneath that, the foundation of all of it is this recognition that we are loved by God. And the way that we know that we are loved by God is because He sent His Son Jesus to live among us, to be an example for us, to die for us, and to overcome our sin and separation from God through his resurrection. This is why we come to the table every week, to remember the good news of God's grace. That God loves us this much. His son's body broken, his blood poured out for us. That we might receive salvation, abundant life, relationship with the God of the universe. Before we can give, before we can invest into other people, we must receive. And so each week we come to the table to receive to remember, to celebrate the good news of God's grace. As we sing these last songs, as we close our time together, take communion, take this meal, the body of Christ broken for you, his blood poured out for you, and remember the good news of God's grace.
To close our gathering today, I just want to come back to Paul's mission statement from Acts 20, 24, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. May you have opportunities to do that this week in your circle of friends. Grace and peace, everyone.